Well, good morning. Labor Day weekend. It all started with a riot. Uh, about 100 years ago, I guess, there was some discontent over declining wages, and so there was a major strike, and eventually workers got a little bit more favorable treatment, and so we get to have a day off because of it. So uh, uh, a lot of our holidays, we forget the, the roots and origins of them. Uh, I, I observed a personal holiday this past week. I uh, had a birthday. I had my 29th anniversary of my 39th birthday. And uh, uh, I think that was something like that. <laughs> but uh, one of the highlights of that was I got to spend some time with my son. Uh, Friday morning went to breakfast. So that was a special treat. And today my family's here. Uh, my daughter-in-law and a... Uh, My goal would be to keep my dear grandsons uh, somewhat awake uh, this morning. But, uh, you know, I, I find that as I'm getting older that what really matters at a birthday are, are not presents. It's really just presents spelled with a C-E at the end. It's, it's people, isn't it? Haven't you found that out? Because by now we, we've already accumulated most of the junk we need. And, uh, but people are so, so precious and valuable. But little Jimmy was still at that age where it was what he got for his birthday that really, really mattered. Uh, Jimmy wanted so much to have a wristwatch, not one of these. He wanted the kind that glows, you know, when you push the button and, and tells you time in three time zones and all that. And Jimmy was just so excited about his birthday coming up and he kept pestering his parents, I want to watch, 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 I want to watch. And his parents finally got so exasperated, they said, Jimmy, the next time you bring this up, uh, you, you're not going to get anything for your birthday. You, you all parents have done that, haven't you? The ultimatum. I'll banish you for life. Uh, no video games for the next 500 years, you know, that kind of thing. And so, uh, and so Jimmy did a pretty good job of uh, not saying anything. He just kept mute. His birthday was coming up. Until one night they were having family devotions. And uh, one of their customs was to have different members of the family share maybe a favorite verse of theirs. And so it was Jimmy's turn, and so he said, my favorite verse is uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 37, in the words of Jesus. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. <laughs> so, there are, there are different ways to, to hint at things. Uh, and we all know what it's like. We all know what the hints are like. We've had the hints, haven't we? People hint. Wouldn't it be nice to go to San Diego this weekend? Or wouldn't it be nice to this and that? Well, you know, in Scripture we also find hints. And I'd like to have you turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul starts his letter out. And normally when I preach through Scriptures such as Philippians, a letter like this, I, I don't spend a lot of time in the opening words because they're standardized greetings. But I'd like to slow down this morning and just take a look at what Paul has to say to the Philippians because as he says hi, almost literally says hi, this is Paul, he, he hints at some things he wants them to remember. And I think at listening to the hints that he gives them and seeing how some of them are, are expressed more fully in this letter, we'll also learn some things about our own lives. And I'd like to invite you to stand with me for the reading of just the first We'll look at just the first uh, six verses of Philippians. We'll continue on in verses 3 and on next Lord's Day, Lord willing. But uh, just listen as I read chapter 1 of Paul. And this is a standard greeting in a letter. In our letters we say, dear so-and-so, and then at the very end, you've got to wait to the very end to see who, who signs it. Well, in the ancient world, they'd start with the author. And then they'd go to who they're talking to. And then they'd usually say, I hope everything's okay with you. So this is the New Testament way of adapting that to an inspired letter of God. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's read verse 6 together. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
And Father, we've already celebrated that in anticipation of the day of Christ Jesus, we took the bread and the cup. And in anticipation of that day, may we take heed to what was on the heart of the Apostle Paul to a little church 2,000 years ago. And I pray that we might learn from how it relates to our lives and how we live out our faith in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a group of people. We looked at last week from Acts 16, a church that was very dear to his heart. An entire chapter of the New Testament is spent on how that church was founded. And if you remember right, uh, Philippi exists today as ruins. It was a, a, a colony in the uh, first century. It was a city that was originally uh, founded. We don't know. It's lost in the mists of time. Its original name meant springs. Evidently, there was a lot of water there. We know the river ran nearby. Uh, Philip of Macedon, uh, of, of Macedonia, he conquered the city and named it after himself. And that's where it gets the name Philippi. Uh, his son uh, became even more famous than Philip. Uh, his son was named Alexander. We'll call him Alexander the Great. Mas uh, Philip Philippi had some interesting uh, points in its history. It was a site of a battle that changed the course of the Roman Empire and so forth. But Paul visited there around the year 50 and he walked these streets and he shared the gospel with an international businesswoman named Lydia and with an ex-veteran, uh, army veteran, jailer. Uh, we don't know his name. And the church began. We know that some of the people that uh, came to Christ had names like Yodia, Syntyche, Clement, Epaphroditus, and so forth. But he loved this church. They loved him. They supported him. And so it was sometime later that he was in prison. And there are a variety of theories. The most common one, traditionally we believe that he wrote this about 12 years after his first visit. He'd seen them since. But he wrote it from Rome. Uh, it's possible he wrote it earlier than the year 62. He might have written it from uh, Ephesus, possibly, or from Caesarea. But uh, the traditional view seems to fit most of the facts. There's just a lot of things we don't understand about all the ins and outs of the history and the details. But uh, Paul... Uh, wrote to them and had a very personal letter uh, to them that he shared with them. Now, I'd, I'd like to just take a look at the opening, just two verses, and you're going to say, boy, this is great, only a three-minute sermon. I love it. Uh, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> just take a look here that Paul starts out, like all these ancient letters did, by identifying who the author is and maybe those people who are with him. And he, he just simply says, Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy had been with Paul when he'd started the church. And if you flip over to chapter 2, you'll see that he's planning to send Timothy. In verse 19, Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. So he was planning for Timothy to take a journey to Philippi and bring back news. Now, notice what he says about Timothy. Because he, he, he opens this letter calling Timothy a fellow servant. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Wow. If he were to talk about us today, if Paul were to use these words about us, how many of us would he say, I have no one else like him? Because everybody else is concerned about all their, their own business. Very few people really care about others. Really care. And that was Timothy. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. So we go back to the opening and he identifies Timothy along with him as servants of Christ. It's the only time he ever calls anybody else a servant in, in a greeting like this. He, he alludes to a few others in Colossians as servants of the Lord. Paul called himself a servant of Christ, but here he includes Timothy, and evidently Timothy didn't write this letter. Paul writes the entire letter from his own vantage point with a singular, I, Paul, am writing to you, but he includes Timothy as a fellow servant, which, which is interesting when you stop and think about why would he give this title, which he didn't give very often, why would he give this title to Timothy as well? And I think it's because of Timothy's heart and his life. But there's another reason we'll, we'll get to. 
before we, we get there, I just want to remind you of, of the New Testament teaching that servanthood is a, is a core part of what is taught about what it means to follow Christ. Uh, in Galatians, but you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. In other words, you're free in Christ. So I'm free to do whatever I want, and I can be as disobedient as I want because I'm free to be disobedient. That's not what freedom means. Freedom does not mean freedom to do whatever is possible. Freedom is to do whatever is right. We do what is pleasing to God. We're free to do it the right thing. That's the freedom that is being talked about here. Rather, because you're free, be a slave. Serve one another in love. Serve, the same, the same root, the idea of a slave. Now, there were two concepts of being a slave when Paul wrote this letter. The one was the local culture, the Greco-Roman culture, which was built on slavery. Slaves did not own anything. They were at the whim of their masters. Many were treated well. Many more were treated terribly. They could be killed and Roman law started to equalize some of that and made uh, treatment a bit more equitable, but it was, you, you were property. You didn't have any more value than the coffee table. Uh, you were a piece of property and you had certain role. Maybe you were elevated as a slave because of your intelligence, that you've been caught in war, a prisoner of war, and so a horrible system. And we know our country was just destroyed by slavery here. And slavery still exists in our world. It's a huge problem. Some say there's more slaves in this century than in, in more recent centuries, uh, different types of slavery. But there was another aspect to being a servant or a slave, and that was in the Old Testament, there was the idea that the servant of the Lord was somebody who had the true God as their God, and they sought to serve him. And so whatever those aspects, the idea is, is that I'm not my own, I'm bought with a price, I serve the Lord, or as uh, Peter said, um, mentions live as free people but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil live as servants of God and so if you have no idea what you're supposed to do as a Christian besides just these two verses you know that you have two opportunities serve others be available to to be a blessing to others and serve God seek to praise him and worship him and live a life pleasing to him and let him look at your life on Saturday night the same way he looks at it on Sunday morning. That you belong to him and he's your God. And so Paul speaking about him and Timothy is, re is reminding the Philippians of something they need to remember. Because down in chapter 2 he's going to spell it out a little bit more. Chapter 2 he says verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Paul, as it were, hints at the fact that we're never going to get along as Christians until we remember who's boss. And the boss is the Lord Jesus. And we're just servants. And we're to be humble servants. And we're to care about other people. And he gives the example there of Christ. And it's, he uses the exact word there. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He, he talks about him as being in the very nature of a servant in verse 7. So Paul is hinting that although Timothy is not the apostle, although Timothy is uh, younger than him, although Timothy is a, a, a disciple of the apostle Paul, there's an equality between Paul and Timothy when it comes to their service to the Lord and to each other. We're all in this together. And uh, if you're taking notes, I just have three real simple uh, points in my outline this morning. If you're taking notes, uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, reminds us that we are servants as well. And as you read about these who modeled the Christian life, you're reminded of your own life. If they call themselves servants, how much more should I see myself as a servant? But you know, almost every problem we have with other people goes back to this. We forget it. Because as I go through life, people don't serve me. And man, that's irritating. Don't they know who I am? I'm speaking for you, okay? 
You can laugh at me, but laugh with me, would you? Uh, don't they know who I am? One of the reasons I've always struggled with golf is because that golf ball does not serve me. <laughs> and I've discovered that I'm just not humble enough to play golf. <laughs> um, I, and one of the great aggravations in life, and those of you who have these long commutes every day, you know how this goes, other drivers don't serve you. And we respond the way any sovereign responds. How dare you get in my way, you peons. And we get irritated, don't we? Every time I'm irritated, it's a reminder to me that I've forgotten who I am. I'm a servant. If I really believed I was a servant, then, I, then if other people cut in front of me, I'd say, wow, what a great opportunity I just had to let somebody get down the road quicker. Yeah, doesn't that sound good? Yeah, especially if you're the driver in front. This attitude of being a servant is fundamental to what the Philippians were forgetting. And Paul starts with a hint. I'm, I'm not the big apostle and Timothy's my co-worker. We both are servants. And Philippians, I, I want to let you know, we're going to get into this later on in the book, but your problem as a church, particularly Yodia and Syntyche, you've forgotten how to serve each other. And so we are here to be servants of God and servants of one another. And then he goes on to a, a normal first century greeting. I'm the writer. It's sort of like how we call, you know, hey, mail in here. Is this, is this George? You know. um, it says two, two, and he addresses them. But in addressing them, he identifies who they are as well. He's already hinted they ought to all have the attitude of a servant. But now he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. What's a saint? What's a saint? Well, saint is somebody who's been recognized by the Catholic Church as having performed miracles and having spectacular holiness, right? And so none of us ever has a chance at that. <laughs> well, that has a, that's a different definition of saint because the New Testament uses saint to refer to every person who belongs to Jesus Christ come to know Christ as Savior, who has been set apart. That's what the root meaning is of that verse. Has been set apart unto God. A saint is one who has been sanctified, related word, set apart unto God. At the same time, a saint is one who not only has a status of being set apart unto God, but also is on a journey to become what they are. And when a person becomes what they are, we call them holy sanctified, and it's a lifelong journey. I do not believe in the misnomer that you can achieve perfect sanctification in this life. Maybe you grew up in a church that taught that. Whoever taught you that was wrong because uh, <laughs> how to win friends and influence people. But, uh, uh, and I understand what they're trying to say by that. And yes, there are steps we go through in our life, but uh, my dad uh, years ago was talking about a fellow that taught that. Uh, he, was, he went to a church that taught you could achieve sinless perfection. Uh, fortunately, the fellow was fired from the company for stealing. But, uh, um, and that's the problem. You set yourself up for tremendous struggle when you say, I've arrived. Because <laughs> as soon as you've arrived, you have, to, you have to start redefining sin and failure. That wasn't sin. That wasn't sin at all. That was just a, a little minor oversight. And we don't call things what God called them. So we're in process. We're on a journey to become what we are. We are saints. We are set apart unto God. And we're on the journey to live that out to be holy people. But notice what he says. To the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. We've got to live this out in our geographical location. And so when you leave here today, you are the saints at Nuevo, Hemet, Paris, Menifee, who did I miss? Uh, maybe out of state or whatever, but you, uh, Ukaipa, yeah, I don't leave myself out. So we are saints set apart unto God. We have status and importance, but we have to live it out in our locale. And we're as much saints when we leave here as while we sit here. We may look very sanctimonious, to play on that word, at church. And over the years, I got well trained in how to look spiritual. Have you? You go to church and 
We could be raging, mad, getting here because those people didn't serve me on the road. <laughs> and, uh, and then we get here and how are things? Oh, praise God. Great. Ah, Lord's so good. Lord's so good. I can't wait to leave here so I can chew my spouse out. Um, <laughs> and he's reminding the Philippian Christians that they have an identity. You know, we live in an era of identity politics. And we live in an era where people don't know who they are. It changes every week or day. Let me remind you that your identity is not all the stuff that the world throws at you. If you know Christ as your Savior, you're a saint. You belong to him. Now act like it. That's the hint <laughs> from Paul. And then he also addresses the overseers and deacons. The only time he does this in his writings. And the overseers are identified in Acts. For example, Paul said, I want to meet with all the elders of Ephesus. They gather, and then he addresses them as overseers. And it just means to have responsibility, leadership responsibility to make sure things work. We don't know how formalized this role was at the time of Philippi. He also says, and deacons. Now, deacon just means servant. And we don't know if there were roles where they had elections. I remember I was in India years ago, and I, I heard the story that some uh, people would campaign, pay bribes to get voted in as deacons in the church. Sort of shattered my idea of the ideal overseas Christian group, you know. Well, deacons are servants. They're, uh, they're, they, they're those who help others. It's not about status. And maybe he's just referring to everybody at the, in the church. Maybe he's referring to what the overseers were to see themselves as, as just servants. But the reminder we have is you live your Christian life as a saint in your environment as part of a local church. And the notion that a Christian is a solitary lone ranger dump it up, dump it up, uh, that goes around and finds the perfect church to favor them and serve them and be good enough for me is nowhere in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you are part of a local congregation with overseers and deacons. Those, there's structure, there's accountability, there's responsibility. And my spiritual growth is in the setting of others. And we've got this notion that I grow best when I'm all by myself, me and Beth Moore, you know, it's just life is perfect. Or, or your favorite teacher on your podcast. No, we grow the best with that cantankerous person down the row. Made you look. No, uh, uh, We grow best because we've got to put up with people. And millions of Christians are missing the growth in sanctification because they run from the problem people instead of learning to grow up and face them in, in Christ and serve one another. We belong to a local body of believers. And we don't take that lightly. And then Paul gives a normal greeting. It was, it was normal to say, peace be with you. you know, How are you? I you know, uh, hope things are going well. Just to be nice. But he wasn't just being nice. He actually had some theological umph in these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you realize those words, what, what those teach us, I think it's just a good reminder, as he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, if I'll go on and re review that point, we are saints. And then, as we look at the uh, verse 2, we, we are reminded of grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As saints now, we are blessed. Grace and peace. That's what every human being is looking for. People want to be treated in a way that they don't deserve. We all want treatment we don't deserve. Isn't that right? You're racing down the road and you see the lights behind you and you pull over and go for your license and your registration. You're hoping for grace. You're, 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 you know, you're hoping that you'll be treated better than you deserve or like mercy, you know, you don't get what you deserve. <laughs> But grace is what we're all looking for. That's what you're looking for in your family. That's what you're looking for in your spouse and your friends. You want to be treated uh, with grace. 
that, that empowering love and care and that, that you're valuable and being given that what you don't deserve. And we've all had that experience. We're treated nicer than we deserve. I know I have. I've been treated nicer than I deserve. Not all the time, but most of the time I've been treated nicer than I deserve. Sometimes I've gotten what I deserve. So everybody's looking for grace. And that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We just celebrated him. The bread and the cup. He poured out his grace, his goodness upon us. We have eternal life and salvation because of his grace. And peace. Every person in the world wants peace. They want their soul to calm down. They want their relationships to be harmonious. They want the world to be a happy place to live. That's what we're longing for. And the New Testament reminds us that our, that peace comes through the work of Christ. And Paul wants the Philippians to remember that this grace and peace is ours from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, but then it gets turned around and shared with others. And so if there's not peace in the church, we're missing out on some link there. Because we have every reason to be united. I think that's what Paul is hinting at. We have every reason to be united. Now notice something in these, in these two verses. Christ appears three times. Of Christ in verse 1. In Christ in verse 1. And, and from the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 3. It's all about Jesus. And it's when we forget that it's all about him that we get all tangled up such as the Philippians got tangled up. That we are to live our lives focused on Christ and like the model of the apostles and the models of Christians that have gone before us is that we are servants. So, Lord, I, I want to be a servant. I want to learn to serve. I want to learn to care about others and, and please the Lord by my giving out of myself. I, I want to I live as a saint. I want to... Remember who I am, that I have worth as one who belongs to God, and I want to grow into that. I want to become what I am. And then I've already experienced grace and peace. There's got to be some left over to give to others. And if we could summarize it, it's be the message. We talk about Christ. We talk about grace. We talk about all these things, but the Lord gives us opportunity with all these cantankerous, hard-to-get-along-with people down the pew, across the street, in the back seat, wherever it happens to be, so that we can become more like Christ and be the people he's called us to be. We have everything we need to be united as a church here at Olive Grove. We have everything we need that God's provided to be saints in the world he's called us to. Amen? And so, Father, thank you for bringing us here today, and I pray that as we go from here that we will have a sense of the opportunity we have. And Lord, I thank you for the times we fail because it reminds us we're still growing. We still have a ways to go. May we become all that you have called us to be. May we grow into our sainthood and act like it. May we grow into our servanthood and act like it. And may we rest in and show forth the grace and peace you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.